just wanted to welcome you to this event. We're really happy to present um, this webinar on workshops and how we can effectively uh, be uh, a part of that audience and deliver engaging, interactive, and effective uh, presentations and interaction during those. So thank you so much for being here and I'm going to welcome, welcome Tanya Means as our presenter today. Um, she's got some great material to go over with you. Please uh, look for that poll everywhere um, poll and start participating in the questions that are there and we can get things started. Welcome Tanya. Thanks, Thanks Laura. And welcome everybody to this uh, presentation on delivering an engaged, interactive, and effective workshop. If you have the Poll Everywhere app, it's um, really easy to use that app to go ahead and start the app and put in the um, Tanya Means as the presentation to join. And then you can start putting in your uh, responses. And if you don't have the app, then you can also just use your regular text-enabled phone to um, use the number 37607 and then text your message into the, the poll as well. So uh, we'll be asking a few polls throughout the webinar just to kind of get some of your interaction. But I also want to encourage you that if you don't want to use Poll Everywhere and you just like to talk to me, um, feel free to turn on your camera or to turn on your microphone, raise your hand or um, use the chat to be able to interact with me. So. Um, don't want this to be just a presentation, but I also would love to hear your comments and questions as we go. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started and we'll um, jump right into, oh look, we're starting to get some, some input. Thank you so much. Um, and so go ahead and, and um, think about what you'd like to gain from this webinar, but I will go ahead and move on to the next slide so we can keep up with the time. So as as Laura had said, I'm Tanya Means. I am an assistant dean and director in the College of Business Teaching and Learning Center in, uh, at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And um, I wanted to share with you some of the tips that I have put together for you to be able to develop your workshop spark. So this is how you can get people to engage and interact with you in your workshop and have them leave feeling like they've really gathered some very useful information and made a connection with you so that they'll give you a good evaluation as well. All right, so first of all, what I'd like to do is if you could just describe to me in a phrase or in a couple of sentences, what is the worst workshop you ever attended? Please use any example, um, leave out names if you need to, but tell us some of the things, some of the characteristics of the worst workshop you ever attended. All right, yes, <laughs> lecture, lecture, lecture. Those are difficult ones to attend because you go in expecting it to be a workshop with work in there. And then you really, um, especially after lunch, have a difficult time staying awake if it's just somebody talking to you. Um, yeah, if the slides are there and you can't read anything that's on the slides or if it's a disorganized mess and you go in there and you're not really sure what's going on, that this is also one that I'm gonna talk about a little bit, spending too much time on things that are not essential to actually doing the workshop or people who kind of take over the workshop and start driving it for their uh, interests, for their needs and, and really not letting you get into what you wanted to talk about. Okay, so that's a few things. Um, let's also talk about switching sides here. Tell me the best workshop you ever attended. What were some of the things that you just were walked out of that workshop and you were like, this was an amazing experience. It was the best workshop I ever attended. What were the characteristics of that workshop? It was interactive. You felt like you were engaging with either other participants in the workshop or with the presenter. I love this one. You had action items. You had things you could do when you left the workshop. It wasn't just something you were doing while you were at the conference or while you were at the workshop, but that you knew what you were going to do after you left very memorable emotions, that's one. Um, relevant takeaways, a good learning experience, conversations with other people. These are all really good points about the best workshop. So we're gonna go through and talk about some of these ways that you can have people leaving your workshop saying this was the best experience I ever had, as opposed to the worst experience I ever had. 
So what are some of the things that can lead you into having this best workshop experience? Well, the first thing that I'd like to suggest is that if you think about why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you presenting this workshop? Well, in most cases, it's likely that you are excited about what it is you're doing. You are uh, passionate about what you have. Uh, you are knowledgeable about what you're presenting. And we want you to be able to share that passion and that ex uh, ex excitement with other people and to get them involved and get them engaged and, and evangelize for whatever it is that you're trying to share in your workshop. So remember that as your key when you're going into the workshop and as you're doing your planning. Secondly, I want you to think just a little bit about if there's a wrong way to do a workshop. Think about that for just a second. Now, what I'm gonna say, suggest is that there isn't really a wrong way to do a workshop, other than if it's not really a workshop, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you are, I guess what I'm trying to say is there are lots of ways that you could do a workshop that could be right. But if you don't include your audience or your participants, then you're going to be doing it a, a wrong way. And the people that are attending your workshop expect that you're the expert, they expect you to know what you're talking about, and they want to, you to share your expertise. They don't want it to feel like they're the ones doing all of the work in the workshop, but they also want to feel like they belong in the workshop and they want to feel that it matters to you that they are there. So include them, involve them, and help them to feel like they belong. Now, when you're thinking about your planning, one thing to ask yourself as you're putting together your workshop, is are you just showing and telling? Then it's probably a presentation and they're probably an audience. But you wanna make sure that it is something meaningful and that there's something for your participants to do in order for it to be a workshop. So when they leave your workshop, even if they've only accomplished a very small thing, they need to feel like they've done something. They need to feel like they've accomplished something. So keep that in mind as you go through and do your planning process. And so what I'd like you to do here is to put in some of your thoughts about when something is titled a workshop, but it's not really a workshop. So that we can try and avoid some of those. I'll give you just a minute to put in your thoughts. Also wanna encourage you if you'd like to um, put something in the chat or once you see something pop up that you think is interesting or you agree with, you can uh, vote that up as well. So we've talked about some of these already. No interaction, shop with no work. I love that. Um, yeah, people need to be able to say that they've done something. No hands-on, no takeaways. Now, sometimes it's difficult to imagine how your topic actually has a hands-on component that's meaningful enough to accomplish in the time frame that you have for the workshop. So you really do want to make sure you plan ahead and, and very carefully plan that. Yeah, if it ends early, that's a little disappointing. You feel like you've gone in there, committed the time, but then they wrap up before the time is over. Okay, these are all very good. All right. We want people to feel like when they come out of your workshop that they've gotten their money's worth. Even if it's not a for cost or an extra cost workshop, they're spending their time. They're paying their time. And so you want to make sure that they're happy when they come out of that. And so think a little bit about how you're gonna accomplish that to have them feel that they have best used their time. And even an opportunity cost, they haven't said, oh, I wish I'd gone to this other workshop instead. So you want them to make sure that they feel uh, that sense of having um, spent their time well. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is to consider how you're going to plan the workshop. And you wanna plan it out even almost down to the minute. So how will you spend the time from beginning to end? And how will you make sure that each of item within your workshop is well-timed and well-planned? So the amount of time that you're planning to spend for it is an appropriate amount of time. 
but then you also kind of have to plan in some flexibility and some wiggle room there because some things may take longer or shorter than you think and so you need to be able to have that range and that flexibility and plan alternative options in case something that you were planning to do doesn't work the way you had it planned. So it's almost that multi-plan of, of plan A, plan B, and how everything will go. And secondly is to think about if this is a workshop that um, either will be recorded or that other people will be able to call in for as a virtual workshop, um, you want to make them feel like they're a part of the group. And so you can specifically welcome them in uh, you can have them ask questions, you can ask their question, ask them questions and seek their input, kind of like we are doing right now, where I'm asking you some questions and giving you a way to participate and to engage. I also want you to think a little bit about how you will welcome people in. How will you make them feel like they are invited in and that they belong in that workshop? So there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is that as people walk in the door, as they arrive, you can walk around the room, be, be there and prepared early enough that you have time to just chit chat with people or to say hello and welcome them personally, to help them feel like they belong in, their, in the room, in their group, in their table, and um, make sure that you don't spend a whole lot of time at the beginning of the workshop having everyone go around and do these lengthy introductions, get right into the work of it, but also build time for people to interact and talk to each other. So I've got a few options here about some of the ways that you can help people feel welcome. I'd love to see your votes for what you would do. So go ahead and use that Pull Everywhere app and think about or uh, comment on some of the things that you would do. Would you greet them at the door? Would you ask them to, to introduce themselves to a neighbor? That doesn't take as much time as asking the whole room to introduce each other. If you do need them to interact with each other, that's a good way where you can help them feel like at least the person sitting next to them is somebody that they're familiar with. You can even make it a quick icebreaker where you can ask them to um, tell each other their favorite dessert or where they went on vacation last summer or something just to kind of break that ice and help them to get to know each other just a little bit. Um, you can let them know that you want their input as they go through the session. You can listen to them. You can um, pay, pay attention to the things that they are talking about at their tables and then pull those things out into the bigger conversations. Um, when you, when you address someone's name, if you don't see their card, you can always, or their name card, you can always say, can you tell me your name? And then use their name as you're, as you're talking about whatever it was that they said. All right, so we've got a few things there that people said that they could do. I'll give you just another second to do some more voting. Yeah, I like this one of starting with an intriguing question and then asking people to, to, to discuss it with their neighbor. Very good. And especially if it launches the conversation into what your workshop topic is, then that's a really good way because people's interest is piqued when it is a question. All right. So one of the other things somebody mentioned very early on was this idea of making your workshop interactive. So as you plan, think specifically about how you're going to have the interaction happen through your workshop. It can't be just a general turn to your neighbor and talk about. There really needs to be more of a plan for how you're gonna go through and get people to talk to each other and to engage in the activity. If you think about your participants, what do you know about them already? Well, you know some things because of the conference that they're attending, or you know some things because of the workshop that they're attending, but try and kind of figure out some other things. You might ask a couple of questions in the beginning. Um, to kind of understand either the role of the people that are in the room or the expertise level or something like that that can help you to kind of understand who your participants are and how similar or different are they. You can also help them to make connections with each other and as you do that, that will help them to then possibly be able to collaborate not only during the workshop but maybe even after the workshop if they're, um, if they're still interested in, in doing more on the topic. I think it's very helpful for the workshop, for in the workshop to give your uh, participants opportunities to listen to each other. While you are an expert in the content area because you're presenting the workshop, you likely have other people who are in the workshop who also have expertise in that area. And so 
try to get them to share their expertise with, with each other or even their experiences. Maybe they have terrible experiences in your topic area, but help them to connect that with, uh, with each other and, and draw out their ideas because as they do that, they become more um, creative and the ideas that they might gain can build off of other things. And so leveraging those resources, um, using the expertise of other people in your, in your workshop and helping them to realize that those ideas build off of each other is really valuable. And you can also help them to know how to connect what they're learning in that workshop to other resources or ideas that go beyond the, the compounds of your workshop. Now, one of the things um, that's interesting is the research about attention span. So uh, researchers in Canada recently surveyed uh, about 2,000 participants and they studied brain activity and they found um, through this Microsoft study that um, since about 2000 that the average attention span has dropped from 12 seconds which we used to think wow that's really short now it's the eight seconds so um, we have less attention span than a goldfish and <laughs> the idea of that is that we don't want to constantly be changing things up in order to be able to keep everyone's attention but that does mean that we need to plan for how we're going to keep the attention span of everyone. So using images, that's a great way to keep people's attention. Um, asking intriguing questions, getting people to do things or talk to each other, those are also ways to keep the attention of your participants. Another way to keep the attention is to tell stories. There is a really fabulous YouTube video um, where David Phillips does a TEDx Stockholm uh, talk where he talks about the science of storytelling and he basically shares this idea that the more emotionally involved you are in anything in your life the more um, or the less critical you become of that event and so uh, he talks about using um, dopamine oxytocin and endorphins to um, do what he calls functional storytelling that helps people to increase their motivation, increase their trust, and increase their creativity. So think about throughout your uh, workshop, are there places where you could insert a story that would help people either develop empathy or build trust with each other or get excited about and therefore focus their attention and use those stories to play through uh, your workshop to be able to keep people on track. The other thing that you can think about is to make the ideas and the concepts within your workshop sticky. And Chip, Chip and Dan Heath have a great resource on um, the made to stick model, but it's basically the idea that sticky ideas are unexpected. And so if you want to keep people's attention, you give them something that they weren't expecting. And then use curiosity gaps throughout that experience to keep their attention. And stories are a great, a great way to do that. So look up the made to stick model and look at how you can plan that into your workshop experience. If you include variety in your workshop, that will help as well to keep people's attention. Don't always have them pair and share everything. So maybe there's a pair and share opportunity, but then there's a snowball opportunity, or then there's a um, jigsaw activity or there's some kind of other activity that gets people talking to different people. Um, but with just a little bit of a caveat, a little word of caution here, when you build in that variety, don't give them too many opportunities or too many options because then you might have people confused or um, uncertain of which things they should choose between. So make sure the options are not so overwhelming that they spend all of their concern focus on which of the options they should choose, but that there's enough variety to keep them uh, interested. So it's a balancing act there. So I'm gonna stop here again for a little bit of a poll. Please tell me some of the ways that you could build options into your workshop that would help keep your audience engaged and help them um, be interactive with each other and with you and uh, build off the success of your workshop. I'll give you just a minute to put in some ideas there.
while we're waiting for some responses to come in, I'll, I'll give you an option. So I mentioned um, the pair and share of the snowball. So um, the pair and share idea would be uh, giving somebody something and saying, turn to your neighbor and discuss this. So you two are pairing with each other to then think about it. Or the snowball might be uh, you two pair and share, but then when you're done, turn to the people on the other side of you and, and build off of that. So build your, your conversation into a bigger one. I like the idea of a table competition. So you might have something built out where the people who are at the workshop um, at that table might be able to do some kind of competition or activity in which they would be interacting with each other. Pencils and papers on the table. I like crayons, especially if you're trying to uh, do something where you're getting people more creative. I actually ran a workshop um, with Play-Doh and I've done it a couple of times where I had people um, on a mat and then they were making things out of Play-Doh that demonstrated the concept that we were talking about. So don't be afraid to bring something to the workshop that um, can help with that creativity and that activity. Post-it notes are good, stickies, um, little stickers that they can vote with. Those are some different ways to do that as well. A worksheet for note-taking, or you can do it digitally where you can have everyone do a shared document that they could um, add their content to. I've actually done PowerPoint slides that have um, edit uh, capability and then s use the bit.ly link and let people jump into the PowerPoint slides and add their content to the slides. So that's also a good resource for people to take with them after they leave. All right, very good. The collaborative game, that's another idea. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for inputting those. I'll actually take these results and insert them into the slides when I'm done so that when they get shared out, you'll have the, the, the results as well. All right, so another thing I wanted to talk about just a little bit is how you use your space. So most of the time when you go to do a workshop in a conference presentation or a conference setting, you don't have a whole lot of flexibility with how you use the space. So it's good to know what the space looks like and it's good to know how the space is gonna be set up and then plan around that uh, space layout and try to use the space to the best of what you can given what your, your parameters are. If there's a lot of people in the room, that may change how you use the space. Um, and if there's a few people in the room, you, you also wanna think about that and how you can adjust and, and make changes to your actual session depending on how many people are in the room and how the space is laid out. So think about that ahead of time. And in fact, we're gonna be talking about logistics and layout of the rooms when we get to the end of this. Um, the next thing to consider is paying attention to your time. So in your plan, you set up, this is how I'm gonna use my time. In the actual workshop itself, make sure you mind that time. And um, the, worst, the worst thing is to be you know, halfway through or almost done with your workshop and realize you've only covered a third of your materials or activities. So the best way to handle that is to do a lot of practice. Practice, practice, practice before so that you come in and you know how the flow of your workshop is going to go and how your time is being uh, used while you're in the workshop and then where you need to make adjust adjustments given what your plan was. I also want to caution you to be really careful of the media that you choose to use ahead of time. So if you are going to use video and um, you, you want to run it off of Wi-Fi or something like that, make sure you go into the room plenty of early plenty early so that you can test it, make sure it plays, make sure the audio works and have a backup in case it's not going to work. But I also encourage you not to rely too much on bringing in external video content into your workshop because uh, just things can go wrong, but also your attendees or your participants are there to interact with you and to do things in the workshop. They're not really there to watch videos that they could do outside of the workshop. If you have some really great videos and you wanna use just little clips of them, you could do that, or you could also um, provide them as links for people to watch after the workshop is over. The other thing to remember is sometimes um, if you want to build in like um, a short little demonstration of something, sometimes you can create it as an animated uh, image file and that could autoplay even if you didn't have uh, any kind of Wi-Fi or anything like that. So just be really careful about that. Going back to our very beginning, 
remember that you have this passion for this for this topic that you're doing your workshop on. And so as you go through your workshop, try to show that passion in the things that you say, in the way that you behave, so that you are inspiring your participants to go out and do something great when this workshop is over. Help to inspire them to be passionate about this as well. And give them some kind of a call to action. We talked in the very beginning about this idea of having something actionable that they could do. Think about that and present that as when you leave this workshop, I'd encourage you to go and do whatever it is. So encourage them to consider what they're going to do based on what they have done in the workshop. And then after the workshop, let the participants know how they can get your materials. One of the best things is be a good presenter and put your materials on, on, the, um, on the program webpage so that people can go and download them and follow up with them afterwards. If you get everyone's um, contact information, you can always just say, here's my card, follow up with me, or I'll take your card and I'll follow up with you and give you some additional resources. You can always do that as well, um, especially if you have digital format, digital format files that you'd like to share with them. All right, so another place for you to put some of your input. What's one of the ways that you plan to follow up with your workshop audience members or your participants after the session? And I believe this one allows you to pick more than one. So everyone should pick that. Post your materials to the conference session page. You definitely can do hashtags and, and um, tweet out your materials. I would encourage you though to think carefully about um, how you're gonna tweet that out in a way that's usable for people. Um, or if you are using hashtag, encourage your participants to use the hashtag for the things that they're thinking as they go through the session. All right, very good. Right. And mainly the next thing is I just want to encourage you that you can do this. You've been selected to do a workshop because you've got a really good idea. You've got the expertise in the background to be able to do it and um, and just go out there, have the, the confidence to go and do it and put on all that planning and that prior, prior uh, practice into play and go out there and actually accomplish it. And so um, we'll wrap up this part with just getting from you. What are some of the most helpful suggestions that you got from the session today? And I'll give you just a minute there to input those. Yeah, I'll talk just a bit more about that shared resource. So um, it's important to make it easy for the people in your session to be able to access, access that shared resource, whether you use a QR tag or you use a hashtag or you use a bit.ly link or a shortened link. Um, that's a really good thing to have maybe on each of your slides for people to be able to know how to access it, especially if they come into the session a little bit later and they um, haven't gotten that first slide that has the, the tag on it. Um, so using that shared resource and then just making sure that if you set it to be a, a like a shared Google Doc or a, a Google Slides, make sure that you set the permissions so that the permissions allow people to come in and edit or comment depending on what you want them to do. All right, we've got some things about planning ahead, practicing to use your time well, and being flexible. All right, oh, one more, thinking about the interactions. Very good. Yeah, if you can kind of imagine what it will be like to be in the workshop and imagine the kinds of things that people might ask or the things that they might say or the questions they might have for each other, then that would be a really good way to think about how those interactions will happen in the real setting. And then oh, test, 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 always test because <laughs> technology always can go wrong. And there, but, there's, but there's good ways to overcome it as well. All right, great points. And then the last one here is, do you still have any questions? You can either turn on your camera or your mic and ask your questions verbally, raise your hand or um, ask them in the chat or put them into folder, whichever you prefer.
Yeah, I like Katie's point. One of the common comments from people is that the presenter um, had a great session, but they didn't, didn't post their materials. Katie, have we gotten any other questions in the chat? We have not. We've had a couple of good suggestions. Um, Todd, Todd mentioned Todd, yeah. that they made a whole workshop agenda using a coloring book. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Todd, how'd they do that? Uh, well, I uh, posted a link to the booklet uh, there in the chat. Uh, you know, um, doodling, just it's good stuff, right? And people often just want to doodle and color. So we put a brand new box of crayons and a coloring book in front of them, and it was the whole agenda. It, wor it worked. Awesome. People took them. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So Tanya, I went ahead and linked the um, TEDx uh, David Phillips uh, presentation. Oh, good. So everybody good, good, good. access to that. Excellent. Yeah, he does a really good job of uh, demonstrating how to use each of those, um, the, the endorphins and whatnot to, to get people um, engaged and and to um, use those as tools in your in your stories. So that's great. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, then I'll turn it over to the OLC presenter group for talking about logistics. Thank you, Tanya. Um, you always do a great job with these webinars, and this has lived up to our expectations and I paid particular not that I wasn't paying attention in previous I certainly was but extra attention today because I'm actually going to be a first-time presenter at the conference as well stepping on the other side of, of the conference but um, so I wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, the room setup and other logistics about your presentation at OLC Accelerate coming up so the rooms are primarily set in round tables. So you'll have those round tables for your participants um, to be able to do some of those activities more collaboratively. And um, there will be a podium and head table for three at the front of the room and mics. So usually we have mics in the room unless it's a really small room. But I, I just wanna emphasize here that it is really, really important to repeat any questions or any comments that have been asked by your audience using the mic so that everyone is able to hear. Um, you know, this is an accessibility consideration as well as just being, you know, a good, a good practice. So please take care to definitely use those mics. And if you have uh, audience participation, pass that mic around, um, you know, so that everybody can hear what's being said. And Tanya, you already talked about this, but it's also really important to upload your slides or your handouts or any supplementary materials to the conference management system. We will be sending out an email with specific instructions on that, um, either probably late February. So do look for that. There are already instructions on the presenter FAQ page, so you can do that earlier. I know I've received a couple of presentations already and uploaded those, but it is really important to do, to include that information for your fellow conference attendees. As I mentioned in the chat, it is the most common comment that we get in our post-conference surveys and going through the presenter evaluations that people are looking for those materials. They want to see those materials, whether they attended your session or whether they had a conflict and had to pick between two sessions. You know, it's just one of the most important things I can stress for you today. If you could go to the next slide, please, Tanya. There we go. Sorry Thank about that. You. So the rooms are set up for a 16 by 9 slide format. Of course, the 4 by 3s can be accommodated, but you'll get a lot of, you know, black space on the sides that is really valuable real estate for your content. So uh, just so that you know, please plan on doing your slides in 16 by 9 format. 
and also uh, start and end with the session evaluation slide and encourage your attendees to submit evaluations of your session. There will be prizes for those people who submit evaluations. There will also be a prize for uh, the presenter as well. So again, this is a really important to encourage those attendees to provide you with feedback so that going forward, you know, you'll know how to improve, what you did well, all of that. So we will be sharing out the evaluation data to the presenters post-conference. It usually takes a week or two, um, but uh, it, it's something that we encourage you to do and actively is to encourage people to submit those session evaluations and be eligible for that prize drawing. There is a wireless internet in the conference space, so your attendees will have access to that. But as Tanya mentioned, make sure that you do have a backup and you test your technology. And we do also have hall monitors. So if you need AV assistance or you encounter a tech issue, um, you can grab the hall monitor assigned to the hallway near your presentation room, and then they will know to either flag down an AV or IT assistant roaming the hallways or get in touch with me so that I can put a call out to our tech team to assist you in that room. So with that, I am going to see if there are any questions about logistics and room setup and all that before I turn things back over to Laura to talk about um, the presenter services coaching option. Anamir, the internet, is it reliable? Well, this is a new space for us. We've never been in this uh, hotel before, so we always plan on it being reliable. Um, that being said, it is an internet that is provided by um, a contractor that works with the hotel. So, you know, our intent is that it's reliable, um, but you should always have a backup plan just in case. And I think I'll jump in just to say real quick, the two things typically that I like backup plan for myself are um, having the content like either on a website or in like some kind of mobile friendly situation so folks can view things on their phones because um, people can pull, you know, their phone internet, of course, as well. Um, but also uh, this year, um, looking at doing a, having a partner um, in our session that's operating off-site to also lead some of the like online pieces as well. So they're still connected and we still have like that connection in the group. So those are just a couple of, a couple of recommendations too um, for your, you know, always plan on things uh, failing. So. Yeah, thank you, Keegan. And as Christine mentions in the chat as well, we do have an OLC tech support team of six people to assist as needed throughout the conference with tech issues. We also actually have a tech support desk that will be near on-site registration um, for people who may need help uploading their presentation materials or who um, need some guidance with the mobile app or anything like that. I'll just jump in and say, as, a, as I've done several workshops that were heavily reliant upon technology, I know that I've had really good experience in working with the OLC team to make sure that everything is up and running and ready to go. And when we've had any kind of failures, they've always been over backwards to try and make sure everything was working. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tanya. Our tech team works really hard and tries to resolve any potential issue as quickly as possible and they are there to help all of us. All right, if there are no other questions, um, Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the coaching program? Okay, sounds good. So hopefully you all are aware of the presenter services and these webinars are a part of what we're trying to bring um, to all of you before the uh, conference starts. And one of those opportunities is also coaching. And that can be a great opportunity, even if you're an experienced presenter, to get some ideas and tips on how you could do better. So we have a team of coaches waiting for people to sign up. 
They are uh, really excited to work with presenters. They all have a lot of experience presenting themselves and have presented at OLC multiple times. So they're very familiar with how OLC does things. And so they are eager to help you in whatever way would work best for you. Uh, the options are to meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, before the conference and kind of go over your presentation, how you could enhance your slides, you can practice your presentation with them, and then you also can work out with your coach potentially, excuse me, um, meeting up on-site as well. Uh, there isn't a, a space set aside for practice, but there's always going to be a room empty somewhere and we can work with the team at, um, and find you a space where you can practice, where you can set everything up, run through all of your slides and feel more comfortable in the session itself. So we really hope that you'll go ahead and sign up. Of course, you can't click the link right here to sign up, but if you go to Presenter Services for Innovate 2020, there is a sign up link right there. Um, and we'd love to have you join us for that. Thank you all so much for coming today. We hope that you found this valuable and we hope that you will also join us at um, the other sessions that are happening in the next week or a couple of weeks. So we have other session types and other presenters coming to help us uh, talk through how to do these sessions. So Hopefully you will be able to join us then and we look forward to seeing you and watching your workshops uh, during the conference. Thank you, Laura. And one final reminder before we say goodbye is that this workshop or this webinar has been recorded and the recording link will be posted on the presenter services page and on our YouTube presenter services playlist. And I'll send that out to all of the workshop presenters as well so that you will have access to the resources and the webinar recording for your reference. Um, I will also post Tanya's slide deck uh, as, as a reference for you as well. And my slide deck also has the notes uh, that I talked through too. So if you can't remember what went with the picture, then you can look into the notes section and see the points that I talked about. Special thanks to Tanya and the BOLC Presenter Services team for the webinar today. We look forward to seeing all of you in Chicago in uh, a few weeks. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, thanks everybody.